okay good good evening to all we welcome you all to the sprouts monthly lecture series and the last session of biodiversity festival commemorating the international biodiversity day our today's session is on the topic 20 years of hornbill research and conservation in northeast india by dr aprajita datta let me introduce dr aprajita datta before proceeding ahead for the session dr aprajita leads ncs eastern himalaya program under which research and community based conservation with hornbills as a flagship has been carried out for 20 years she completed her phd in hornbill biology on hornbill biology and their role in seed dispersal in 2000 some of her other work has involved understanding hunting and logging impacts biological exploration in arunachal pradesh and new mammal species discoveries seed dispersal and seed predation <laughs> establishing community based conservation intervention with tribal communities uh, nature education forest restoration establishing a hornbill nest adoption program in arunachal pradesh she has written several books for children she has been a member of the national tiger conservation authority uh, and the state wildlife advisory board of arunachal pradesh she has engaged with government on the management of several tiger reserves and critiqued proposed hydro power projects in arunachal pradesh she now believes that doing research is more satisfying and easy than on ground conservation and that reconciliation between wildlife and people is not always possible i would like to now hand over the session to dr aprajita datta uh thanks very much mahesh um uh, good afternoon everybody or good evening um i mean it's quite <laughs> intimidating to be doing this um i've never done this kind of a webinar or whatever online talk with so many people that i can't see um i'm not very digitally uh, you know savvy so uh, you know i'm a luddite uh, old old generation kind of person but um so without uh, you know much more ado i'll uh, you know start my talk um there's quite a bit to go through because it's um it's really based on you know 20 uh, years of uh, research and conservation in northeast india as the title says which has um, you know we've looked at many different aspects of hornbill biology and uh, along with the biology there's been some approaches to conservation so i'll um, i won't be able to cover everything but i'll be just um, giving you maybe snippets of some aspects of the work and what we found so you know hornbills all of you must be knowing hornbills and they are amongst the most conspicuous you know tropical uh, in asian forests they're the most you know conspicuous birds um very large usually their coloration is black and white or brown actually but they're striking because of their you know very colorful casks or you know the kind of water you know the skin around the orbital skin around the eye then they have these many of them have these very prominent gula pouches throat pouches in which they carry fruits they uh, some of them have very um, you know green glands which have colored oil which is produced you know to uh, you know uh, groom themselves and so they they are very striking and many of them uh, so the word hornbill is because many of them have these structures on their beak which is a cask and it is a keratinized structure um and it has may serve different purposes so they're quite wacky and bizarre looking and you know big birds in the forests so india has nine species of hornbills and many of you would be seeing uh, you know many uh, several of these five of these occur in northeast india and uh, they have been the focus of our study uh, the brown hornbill the great hornbill the rufous necked and the oriental pied and the reed hornbill um so you know the eastern himalayan region is a very as everybody knows is a big you know biodiversity hotspot and it is at the junction of three different realms and so it's a very very uh, important area for wildlife and this has been the region in which most of my work for the last 20 25 years has been um 
although I say Northeast India, uh, because we have progressed to working in some of the other states in the last few years, but most of our work in the past has been only in, uh, mainly in Arunachal Pradesh. And Arunachal Pradesh, as all of you know, has very extensive forest cover, so it got, uh, got, you know, has low human density, and it still, I mean, it is much better explored now. In the last decade, there's been a lot more research going on in different groups. Many new species have been discovered. So it's much better study, but it still remains poorly explored. I mean, there's still a lot more to do here. But before I go on to the meat of, you know, what the work we've done, uh, I just wanted to also talk about the team of people that who have made this large program happen all these years. And um, one of them is Rohit Naniwadekar, who has been a very important person in the program and uh, who was my first PhD student. And uh, then there's a, a you know, bunch of many other researchers who are currently working on different aspects of the program that I'll be talking about. Rohit is now a scientist at NCF and um, there have been several others who've also worked for shorter periods with us on different projects and left to do their PhDs or gone, gone, uh, gone and got some other jobs. Um, and there's been a lot of field staff from different communities who've also been working with us um, in different aspects of the program in Arunachal, as well as um, now in some of the new sites in North Bengal and Assam. And I also have some, you know, admin staff who, who help and support our team uh, and the work. And uh, this is Noyunda and Dhrubodha from Eastern Assam in uh, Joypur, where we uh, began work in the last two years. So, um, you know, our research on hornbills have covered many aspects, starting with uh, some of my PhD work, which was from 97 to 2001 which was a very much more basic biology kind of study because nothing really was known about the feeding and uh, you know, breeding, uh, nesting ecology of hornbills. Um, I also looked at their role in seed dispersal. And while I looked at certain aspects during my PhD time, um, this was followed up by later studies, which looked at other aspects of uh, seed dispersal by hornbills. We also uh, examined hornbill abundances and the impact of logging and hunting on hornbills and also the impact of hornbill loss on uh, regeneration and seed dispersal. In later years, we've also looked at hornbill distribution and conservation status in Arunachal, as well as in some of the other Northeastern states. And so this is a, just a listing of some of the uh, different research focus that has happened over the years. And uh, this is the great hornbill, which is the largest uh, you know, hornbill found in India. It's about three to four kilos, and it is, um, you know, um, our studies have shown that it eats much more figs than the other species, and it is much more sedentary and kind of territorial in the breeding season. And uh, then there's the wreathed hornbill, uh, uh, Rhydiceros undulatus. By the way, the great and the wreathed hornbill have, uh, in the last one or two years, been uplisted to uh, vulnerable by the IUCN. Uh, their status was actually uh, believed to be better before, but because of a lot of habitat loss and hunting across their ranges, they've uh, been uplisted uh, to a more threatened status. The, the wreath thornbill is a much more um, specialist eater of non-fig fruits. It ranges very widely uh, during the non-breeding season. And it also gathers in very large flocks, uh, you know, in the, in the non-breeding season, in large roosting flocks. Um, this is the oriental pine hornbill, which is a much more common and, uh, you know, uh, adaptable species found in secondary forest habitats. Um, it's a much more smaller size species. It's about 800 to 1,000 grams, while the wreath hornbill was two point, is about 2.5 kilos. And this is my most favorite hornbill. This is the most beautiful hornbill, I think, and it is also vulnerable. And it is a, um, the rufous necked hornbill is actually, in some sense, much more um, endangered, although the IUCN status of uh, this is also vulnerable as uh, now for the great and the wreathed hornbill. 
because it is uh, more restricted to the higher elevation forests uh, in Northeast India, and of course also in North Bengal. But um, the extent of habitat is much smaller for this species. And as you will see later uh, during my talk, uh, you know, it, it, it remains very, very um, rare in most uh, you know, pockets of its range in India. Then there's the brown hornbill, which is a you know, very interesting species. It's probably, sorry, it's probably the least known among the hornbills uh, of India. It is a very secretive uh, you know, uh, rainforest species found in some parts of Upper Assam and in Ar uh, Arunachal Pradesh, Eastern Arunachal Pradesh. It also occurs in Mizoram in a few places and Nagaland too. But you know, it's really like very, very small pockets in some key areas. And uh, Joypur Reserve Forest and Dihing Patkai are the two main, uh, apart from Namdafa, are the places where you have better populations of this species. It's also interesting because it's a cooperative breeder. It is, um, you know, it, uh, the male, the adult male is helped by juvenile helpers, um, which are believed to be of the previous uh, brood, which helps the male in guarding the nest and feeding. Um, so, you know, our uh, 20 years of work has been largely in the Parquet Tiger Reserve on hornbills. A lot of the work has been in the Parquet Tiger Reserve, which is 862 square kilometers. By the way, that's a picture of hornbills roosting near the riverside. Um, about 80, 90 of them were roosting here, in, you know, one evening. Um, so this is near the boundary of the park. And uh, so the four, four uh, sympatric hornbill species occur here, the rufous necked in the higher elevations. The brown hornbill doesn't occur here, because this is in Western Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, some of our work on hornbills have also been in Namdafa Tiger Reserve, especially much of Rohit's PhD, not much, all of Rohit's PhD work has been in the Namdafa Tiger Reserve. Um, this is again a fabulous landscape, which is also quite threatened due to various reasons. And here you have five sympatric hornbill species, uh, which occur here. I'm just telling you about, because you know, it, it, this talk is kind of spanning 20 years of work. I was just trying to give you a sense of some of the uh, overall, you know, the places where we've worked for different questions at different times. And another site where we've done a little bit of work uh, for a while was Eagle Nest Wildlife Sanctuary for hornbills, especially for the rufous neck hornbill because it occurs at the higher elevations um, in Eagle Nest. So one of the uh, main functional roles of hornbills is uh, in the forest is as seed dispersers, um, you know, and in these forests, a lot of the plant species are dispersed by animals. And if you can see in this lovely drawing by Arjun Shivatsa, uh, um, you know, there are bats, there are hornbills, there are uh, civets, barking deer, various different bird and mammalian groups that are responsible for seed dispersal, including rodents, which are secondary uh, seed dispersers often when they cache seeds. Now, um, during my studies in my PhD work, I found that 78% of the tree species in Pakke Tiger Reserve were dispersed by animals. And, you know, only the, uh, the remaining were mechanically dispersed and a large percentage of them are also bird dispersed. So, you know, there's a lot of these berries, then figs, and then arillate capsular fruits um, and roots that are uh, dispersed by hornbills and other birds. These are some of the important species in the diet of hornbills. So you have um, Hospildia kingi and Nema angustifolia, which are Myristicaceae species, which are nutmegs. And then you have Polyalkea simiarum, which is an anonyse, it's a droop. Uh, Livistona jenkinsiana is a palm, which is a very important, uh, you know, uh, economically important also for local people. And uh, then there are a lot of these um, arillate capsular fruits, uh, dehiscent fruits, uh, which are eaten by hornbills, which are, you know, um, which are from the Miliaceae. The Miliaceae family is a very important uh, uh, family uh, which has many species which are dispersed by hornbills. So this is on a typical day under a roost tree or a nest tree you might find a lot of seeds like this. So it was all uh, like you know I loved uh, collecting the seeds 
when I see seeds dispersed by hornbills, I get very excited. And, um, you know, I would collect the seeds and, you know, I place them on a leaf and take pictures of the kind of food um, on a typical day. This is under a roost site. And as you can see, there's a lot of variety of seeds that are being eaten and consumed. And there's crab and beetles, there's crab legs and beetles also eaten by hornbills. But, you know, uh, our studies have shown that 90 to 95 percent of the diet of the large body Asian forest hornbills like great and wheat is, you know, uh, is composed of fruits. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to give, you know, um, go into too much of graphs and statistics, though there is some of it later on. Uh, one of the things that we uh, looked at later, I looked at in a different, uh, looked at it in a different way during my PhD time, but uh, we were able to do it for a much larger set of uh, fruits as well as you know, could measure the gap widths properly of many more seed dispersers. Um, this is primarily work led by Rohit, uh, where we uh, could see that, you know, one of the crucial things about hornbills is, you know, birds have this gap width, right, which allows them to um, consume and eat fruits of a certain si size also. So hornbills gaps are very large and they can also, act, you know, uh, they're able to, because their gaps are large, they're able to eat a much uh, bigger size fruits than most of the other bird species. This basically graph shows that. So those, uh, you know, um, those three species are the uh, hornbills as well as the imperial pigeons also are able to eat large, um, you know, fruits. So um, because they can handle these large fruits, they act as important seed dispersers of some of these larger fruit species, which other birds may only peck at. When you peck at it, you tend to drop it, you know, below uh, the parent tree. And then it is not such a, you know, great uh, seed dispersal service. So these are again, some pictures of some of the different, so loracy is also very important in the diet of hornbills, uh, the droops and, you know, so hornbills are very uh, picky eaters and very choosy. They will eat only the ripest of fruits. They will test the, uh, for the softness and the ripeness in their beak. And then they will, uh, you know, kind of, you know, uh, pop it and swallow it, in, you know, in their mouth and eat the seed. So most of the seeds that hornbills eat, which are non-fig, um, seeds of non-fig fruits, are regurgitated because the seeds are processed in similar gut and then they are taken out and uh, you know the flesh is uh, the pulp is removed and the uh, the seeds are regurgitated out uh, only the seeds of ficus which are really really small uh, minute are defecated so this is you know you can see how the hornbill is picking out the fruit uh, the ripe so the, this is the large fruit of ameliaceae it's a dysoxylum so it dehyses and it has 3 to 4 um, uh, arillate fruits. The aril is what the hornbill wants to eat. It doesn't want, it doesn't eat the whole thing. Huh? It'll take the fruit, that arillate fruit, swallow it, and then it will regurgitate the seeds out. So um, as, as part of our understanding of looking at seed dispersal, you know, um, one of the things that, you know, we had not really done in the earlier period was looking at um, how far do hornbills disperse seeds? And we got an opportunity to do that. So I'm not going to go very um, chronologically or sequentially, you know. I've taken uh, up certain themes of work and then I'll cover that and then I'll go on to the next one. So uh, in 2014 or 15, we got an opportunity to do a telemetry study on hornbills we could capture uh, several hornbills uh, to look at their ranging as well as um, uh, for more targeted questions on uh, the seed dispersal distances that they can generate. So our team were able to capture some six hornbills and this shows the home range uh, movement of one of the first birds we captured was a great hornbill and you can see the GPS tag, which is on its back. I'm not going into the details of how we caught it, but it takes a, a lot of effort and a long time to do it. Um, and it's quite tricky. 
um, as you can see, the hornbill has moved. So this is Pake Tiger Reserve, and this is Assam. This is Namiri Tiger Reserve. So it moves. Uh, you know, it has also moved across the river into the reserve forest and the human habitat area. In uh, so this is just a you know picture like a just to show you the kind of movements made by hornbills. The breathed hornbill, uh, which we captured, which was the next bird that we got, a male. Uh, by the way, we did not capture any females or juveniles because that could affect their nesting. So um, the reef tonbill moved much more widely and into Assam as well as into the reserve forest areas. And all of this area, as you can see, has been completely deforested in the last uh, 20 years, uh, this side of uh, Assam in the Shonipur district. So this, I mean, although our main question was related to uh, more about seed dispersal distances, we were able to get some data on the uh, home range size of these uh, individuals that we captured. So we uh, got about four hornbills which were caught in the breeding season. And we knew the nests of those birds. So it's very interesting if you can make out that the, the great hornbill which were caught in the breeding season, all of them have very small home ranges, less than two square kilometers. You know, that was very interesting for us. Whereas if you look at the Reith Tonville home range, even in the breeding season, it was around 54 square kilometers. Yeah. And uh, so it ranged really widely in the breeding season. But the Great Hornbill that was caught in the, in the non-breeding season had a much, much wider home range of 63 square kilometers. And uh, I'll come to that later, but this is also related to the kind of fruit availability patterns that uh, exist in the area. Um, you know, the winter and the non-breeding period is when the fruit availability is very low in the area. Um, so we'd given all these funny names to the hornbills. Uh, one was called Bill, one was called Gabbar and Mogambo, and this is Rohit and all these, uh, our staff. Um, you know, a rifle is a kind of alcoholic drink found in Arunachal, <laughs> Assam, <laughs> which people, so anyway, so, and uh, there was a, a juvenile uh, great hornbill. Well, it was not really a juvenile, but it was a individual which uh, seemed a younger animal. It did not have a, uh, a partner. And it was caught during the breeding season, but it was a non-breeding individual, right? So we found that even that non-breeding individual, which was not an Hello. Uh, ki kindly uh, hang on. She might have had a little bit of a audio. Uh, there is power issues in her area. So she'll join in within a few moments. Yes. Yes. Mahesh? Yes, Anand. Uh, I'll, I'll just call. I, I think she lost a network. Call her up. Yeah, yeah I'll, call her. I'll call her. Yes.
she will log in again so just uh, hold for some time all of you Anand, you had a word with her. Oh, she's she there. Yeah. yeah, she's there. She's there. Uh, Anand, she joined. Yeah. Just tell her yeah. to mute her. Unmute. Yeah. Rajda, on the left hand corner, you have a mic button. You'll have to unmute yourself. Can you spotlight her, Dwiti, please? I'm trying, but that's not happening. I think her okay. connection is unstable. Uh, Dwiti, if you can maybe unmute everyone and then um, yeah. We'll not see the option of unmuting everyone. Okay, no, no problem. I think I'll call her and tell her. Call her, call her again and just check out that there yeah, are some yeah. difficulties. Her audio is not connected. Not a problem.
yeah now see again it's on the hot spot but i don't know how long it will last i'm not muted yeah okay now we can yeah now you're good Um, let me share the screen. Okay. The problem with this um, is that it keeps going off, you know. Maybe I should take off my video. Yeah, you can switch off your that video. Help? Yes, yes, it, it'll reduce your load on the internet. Correct. Yeah, I'll switch off my video. Yeah. Yeah. Your video and yeah. The yeah. yeah. So, um, where was I? You were at the table with all the names of the hornbill? The distance is the species fly off across. Okay. Hello, Prajita? Hello? Is she there? She blinked? Yeah, she's is there. She... The uh, mic is on. Hello? Prajita, you mute. Internet. Yeah, now can you see my uh, screen? Yeah, we can see your screen, but your sound is a little garbled. I think she's dropped. Yeah, I think we lost her. Yeah, she's lost. Uh, yeah, she's dropped. We'll just wait for some five minutes. No, we'll yeah. wait for five minutes to we'll try to get her. Reconnected. Sorry, everyone, for the technological issues. Anand, do you want to call her and check her? I mean, to check uh, okay. yeah. if the internet is okay. Just give me a second. Hello.
महेश हेलो यस यस शी इज जॉइनिंग बैक शी इज स्विचिंग नेटवर्क सो इन द मीन वाइल कैन यू अनाउंस यू वॉन्ट अनाउंस द प्राइजेस ऑफ द कॉम्पिटिशन well i don't mind doing that great do, do you want to show uh, the photos of wildlife and announce it or how do you want to do uh, we will we'll come to that you exp- uh, announce the others na i'll i'll in the meanwhile open those okay yeah i'll i'll do it okay so till the time dr aparajita datta is uh, joining back you would like to announce uh, the uh, prizes of the competition so we had three comp- uh, four competitions we had essay writing we had poetry uh, writing we had poster making and we had wildlife photography uh, and we we got we got a lot of entries and uh, we had a judges which had to go through all the uh, all the material and they came out with uh, you know an entire winning list so we will be having uh, three winners in every competition and every judges have or a group of judges have mentioned a special mentions also i mean so someone who really uh, have done good work ananda prajita has joined okay I think if she she the minute she joins you 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 stop and then you let her continue. Okay, she joined. Okay, she joined. I'm not going to start my video. Hello. Yes, yes. No problem. uh can you make uh, okay yeah um do your share screen and then yeah let's see if my hotspot works better than charu's okay it's clearer yeah fast. yeah it's clear okay yeah. great so where was i okay so i was talking about the home ranges of hornbills and uh about the kind of data that we got and you know the number of uh, so this is not like where people do satellite telemetry or where they do getting home range data for entire year our purpose was to actually get the um uh, you know short distance um, you know like more data for a shorter period but we wanted very fine scale data on movement so that we could look at seed dispersal so our study was more geared towards understanding uh, seed dispersal distances um so one of the uh, i'm skipping a lot of the other work that goes into trying to determine whether hornbills are effective dispersers there are quantitative and qualitative aspects of seed dispersal i'm not going into all of that but i'm just showing you one result to show that hornbills disperse seeds really far um you know from parent trees and this seed dispersal uh you know kernel or the distribution that you see is like a generated one it's based on the movement data that we have the telemetry data that we have uh displacement of hornbills and we also have the gut passage time we determined from experimental uh you know captive trials uh, on captive birds where we fed them seeds and we figured how long hornbills take to regurgitate seeds now hornbills have really relatively long gut passage times and which is another indication of a good seed disperser because if you have a long gut passage time then you are more likely to be depositing seeds further away from the parent tree um seeds which fall near parent trees suffer higher mortality so that's why it's good to take seeds away so uh, that is one of the you know primary uh, you know aspects of Hello. Hi. 
Your um, voice had cracked. Can you repeat? Sorry. And for the reef, the minimum distance was up to 10 kilometers. So the median distance of uh, a dispersal of seeds by great hornbill was around 250 to 300 meters. It was similar in the breeding and non-breeding season. We had two non-breeding uh, individuals and three breeding individuals in the great hornbill. And the maximum distance in the breeding season of seed dispersal was 2.5 kilometers, while in the non-breeding season, they moved you know, longer distances. And the scale of the you know, dis uh, seed dispersal distances is much longer, right? The reef thornbill uh, uh, can disperse seeds up maximum distance of up to 10 kilometers, but this is based on data from one individual male that we have tagged. So, so I have not presented all the data or the uh, thing that goes into determining the effectiveness and, uh, of uh, seed dispersal by hornbills. But uh, so I showed you bits of it. So basically, there are a few factors that make hornbills. Connect to her. Can you guys hear me or am I just going on and nobody's no, we can hear you. able to? Okay. No, because I could hear some other sounds. That's why it can people mute because yeah. uh, yes, then yes. I got distracted. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So one, yeah. So I didn't present, you know, all the methods or the data for the other aspects of it, but there are a few factors that make hornbills good dispersers. One is the large gape size, the fact that they eat a lot of fruits, that they, uh, you know, pass seeds viable and they're undamaged. Then some of our studies have showed that germination success is higher for some of the food species when you compare um, the success of regurgitated seeds versus fallen seeds, you know, seeds which are just fallen, undispersed, uh, you know, from the fruits. They also have relatively long gut retention times, which is greater than an hour, but although it's very variable, they also have a very short visitation length on fruiting trees. Their fruit removal rate is very high compared to a lot of other birds and fruits are swallowed. But some of my PhD research had shown that they do a lot of clump seed deposition at roost and nest trees. And most roost, roost sites are unsuitable for seedling recruitment. And you, you will see that later when you see the kind of roost sites hornbills use. Um, a large percentage of the roost sites, uh, a lot of the roost sites are along the rivers along streams, in open habitats, uh, riverine you know, kind of habitats, uh, which are away from the forest. Um, then even the kind of deposition that they do at nest trees, uh, you know, it, under a nest tree, there's like hundreds of seeds accumulating over the period of four months, and a lot of seed predation and seedling mortality happens. So I didn't present all the graphs or the data related to this, but I just showed you some key aspects based on the more recent telemetry work and stuff, which told us about how, how far they uh, disperse seeds. On seed dispersal, he looked at another aspect of hornbills when they are roosting or when they're nesting, but that's just a small proportion of their daily seed dispersal. What about when they are uh, moving around foraging during the daytime in the forest? Uh, his studies showed that they scatter dispersed seeds on the forest floor to the order of 600 to whatever, 11,000 seeds per day per square kilometer. And uh, as you could see from the graph that I presented, the seed dispersal distances are also quite high for hornbills. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, this is called uh, considered to be long distance dispersal when you look at uh, you know the dispersal distances generated by most uh, seed dispersers so hornbills are like yeah uh, can you put your uh, image this on slideshow board please oh sorry yeah that'd be uh, better no, no? Yeah. Yeah. yeah click, click on the play you from current see? side no no not from that okay yeah sorry sorry yeah <laughs> i'll go no back yeah no play from current slide yes yes huh? why did it go to this one no but it's gone to this one. No, this is the first Where slide. So, yeah. No, okay. I went to a uh, current slide. No, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, kind no, of. No, I'll go it. down. I think yeah, yeah, because yeah. I cl went up the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So now I'll switch tracks a bit and I'll go into 
the breathing biology aspects of hornbills, sequential so the data of each part. So, um, so hornbills, as you know, are believed to be monogamous, and uh, you know, I mean, it's not really been tested properly <laughs> whether they are indeed monogamous, but all uh, evidence points to monogamy. Also, it it is unlikely that they are not monogamous because it will be quite difficult for a male to cheat. Um, you know, uh, he has to feed two females in the nest. So, um, so during the, before the start of the breeding season, there's a lot of courtship feeding by hornbills, okay? So the males will be feeding fruits to the female, trying to coax her to, um, uh, you know, especially before she goes into the nest, she's quite reluctant to go into the nest because it's quite a, you know, a probably a difficult thing to be confined in, in there for three, four months. Um, so, uh, the breeding season of hornbills in the in the in Arunachal Pradesh um, and even in Baksa now we have found is from March to July mainly. Uh, although we are seeing some changes now, which I'll I, I'll talk about, uh, which may be related to climate change. So uh, the great hornbill has a long, um, you know, about 120 days breeding cycle, and uh, they enter the nest during the usually in the first to second week of March. Um, and then they come out, the female comes out in the middle of the uh, breeding season after the chick has grown a bit, usually in June, in the first to third week of June, and the, um, the chick exits uh, in sometime in July. Um, and, you know, so there's a, the other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, a lot of people think that, oh, hornbills are such large birds, they will not, they need really large cavities. But uh, yes, they do need large cavities and tall and big trees and all that, but they also choose an optimal size to enter because the female has to seal the cavity, nest cavity. And it requires a lot of energy to do that. And in the larger hornbills, they just use their feces uh, to seal it. The male does not uh, bring anything for the female to seal. In the case of the oriental fired hornbills, we've seen that the male brings mud uh, to seal. And so when you see the hornbill squeezing in, it's a smaller uh, dimension than what you would think a hornbill can enter. Uh, yeah, so, um, so the thing is that, uh, uh, what was my, okay. So yeah, so the hornbills have this uh, long breeding cycle. The wreathed hornbill, this is very interesting. The great hornbill is a larger body size species, but the Breathed hornbill has a longer breeding cycle. It is uh, from ranges from 120 to 140 days. Uh, the uh, average is 130. Because I think, uh, you know, it feeds more on non-fig fruit matter compared to the great hornbill, which eats a lot more animal matter and figs. Um, this reed hornbill has got a crab in its uh, mouth. So um, one... One of the things that we've done, we've continued to do, and it's now the 22nd year of uh, hornbill nest monitoring, uh, is in Pake Tiger Reserve. We've been monitoring hornbill breeding since my PhD time, with a few years uh, missing in between. Um, and it has been very interesting, although the data is like, you know, I mean, it's something that I've never got separately funding for. It's just continued amidst all the other work that we do. And what we try to do is every year, we try to monitor the uh, nests and we try to find nests every year. What we try to do is find out when is the nest entry dates for all these uh, nests that we are monitoring. And we don't, uh, we don't do intensive nest watches anymore because we have that data from my past work. Uh, but what we do is we go and we check to make sure that they're okay and they're active and that there's no disturbance or also to see if any nests are being abandoned um, or if it's a failure in nesting. And we try to, at the end of the season, we go regularly, maybe once in two, uh, one or two days or three days to check, try to get the exit dates when the chick comes out and if the nest was successful or not and also try to uh, see uh, the chicks uh, which have fledged 
And all this is like kind of very basic observational kind of work, okay? So there's no high tech stuff happening here. Although it would be useful to have cameras and other kinds of ways uh, where you could get much more, um, how will I say, less intensive, I mean, more efficiently uh, get data. Um, so one of the reasons why long-term, so my slide is actually about why is it important? Firstly, it tells you about, you know, long-term, what are the kinds of breeding pairs and how many active, what proportion of nests are active in a year, nesting success. It also tells you about whether there's competition for nest sites between hondil species and uh, how many, why are nests inactive, which nests are inactive. Then it also tells you about nest use and nest turnover reasons for nesting failure may be possible also to understand over a long-term period, right? And also, if you have data over the long-term, you have, um, you can look at whether there's some changes happening in the patterns in nesting, either in the length of the breeding cycle or in the success or in terms of timing of breeding uh, and whether that's related to uh, fruit availability and climatic factors. What has happened with us is that Simultaneously, along with the long-term nest monitoring, we've also collected data on the phenology of fruiting trees. Um, but we've, uh, we don't have the phenology data for the entire 22 years. We have it for a shorter period of time from 2009 onwards. So um, the other, uh, the other uh, aspect why long-term monitoring might be useful is if you want to compare nesting over, uh, um, impact things over space. Uh, in terms of looking at nesting in undisturbed, more intact forest versus disturbed and degraded forest. And we have that because of something, some other project that we started in the same site. Hello. Which is outside the Tiger Reserve. Uh, Tetra Meli Snoody Flora. Uh, um, it is a softwood tall and uh, the bird activity also because of storm damage, you know, the branch. I, oh, I'm also muted. Okay. Oh, yeah. We can hear you. Okay, okay. But yeah. Your slide sharing has stopped. Oh, I didn't do anything. No problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay wait, let me, let me reshare it then. This slide sharing is something that I keep getting confused about. Okay, anyway. Hello. Your voice is. Can you repeat, Aprajita? I think rather than sharing slides like this, if she can go into normal PowerPoint. I think that was comfortable. Hello, but now you can't hear me. Wait. Now we can hear you. Yeah, now you're clear. Both. Go on. Yeah, I don't know what happened because I could see, I mean, I could hear you guys and I had not uh, touched the screen. So oh, I don't know what continue. happened. Yeah. Please continue. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but why isn't it moving forward? Yeah. The other thing is that hornbill nest cavities have a, so here, or if you can see that all three species, 85% of the nest trees are on this tree species. And there's also this other species called Elanthus grandis, which is another of the tree species that is used. So basically two nest tree species are used mainly in Pake area. And so there's a, um, you know, during my PhD, I found that, you know, there's, there's a lot of sim uh, similarity in the characteristics of the nest tree that they use but they do separate in terms of certain characteristics. Like the one of them could be the, related to the shape. So the great hornbill nest cavities are use, usually more elongated slit-like, uh, whereas the wreathed hornbill is very often like an oval 
shape. And the oriental pied hornbill, which is a much smaller size species, um, usually often either it'll have its nest cavity on the main trunk or it'll have it on the tertiary branches, which the great or the reed hornbill would never you know, be able to use. And uh, very often it's round because uh, uh, some of the oriental pied hornbill cavities are created by uh, bird activity, you know, woodpeckers and all other you know, birds. So, um, so that, that's one small like, you know, way in which they might be uh, separating. But there's a lot of competition that we observed later, which I'll come to later. Now the um, hornbill nesting uh, from March to July, it coincides with the peak in the fruiting of bird dispersed species. So the, uh, oops, this uh, shows the rainfall, the bar graph, uh, the bar on one axis shows the rainfall. And in the other axis, I'm showing the fruiting patterns of uh, bird dispersed species. As you can see that there's a peak during the uh, time of the hornbill breeding between uh, you know, May to July in most of the years. Yeah, this is what I found during my earlier study. So now with the long-term data also, when we are now monitoring after 2009, we also see, but the, we have seen some changes in, in the fruiting patterns, um, some of the same set of species and but uh, you know, overall the breeding, uh, the, the fruiting of bird dispersed species is between March to May. And uh, some years, of course, the intensity of fruiting, I mean, the, it remains low, between three to 10%. I think I can't see the, uh, the, the, what the statement says, right? So, but what we found uh, recently with the data that we have from the past, which is during my PhD study and during with uh, now in the last eight years, is that with the same set of 14 uh, hornbill dispersed species, we find that the fruiting uh, pattern is a little different. So uh, some of the fr fruiting trees are, you know, more available, the peak and the, as well as the uh, uh, availability has become much more sort of staggered and scattered, like it's not so um, pinpointed in, in the months of May to July. It is more, uh, it's a bit earlier now, in February, March, and April. So this is a very interesting finding in terms of uh, how the fruiting pattern may have changed in an area. And uh, now, uh, one of the other things I wanted to say is that over the, when you're monitoring nesting for so long, you know, uh, we started in 97, and over the years, this just shows you the cumulative number of nests that we've found over the years. It's actually not that many considering that we've worked for so long. We could have found more if we covered a wider area, but uh, we were unable to cover a wider area for many reasons because we have other work going on and this is just part of several other things that we do. Um, but it just shows, I've just put this list of names to just indicate how many people it took to find so many nests. And many of the people named here are forest department uh, staff, many tribal people also, as well as researchers or interns who came uh, for short periods. And totally we had some 70 to around 80 nests uh, we've known over the years. That's not that many, but our work has been confined, confined to the uh, southeastern part of uh, Pake Tiger Reserve. The other thing is that, uh, wait, hmm. I'll just uh, change this, yeah. Um, the other thing is that we've also looked at, so what this graph is basically showing you is that the percentage, so there are a number of nests that are monitored, okay? So we might have 40 nests, but we may not monitor all the nests in a year uh, because of various factors, you know, logistic reasons. So out of the monitored nests, you know, we looked at the percentage of nests that are active in a given year. And as you can see that it varies quite a bit. The blue, the blue, uh, the blue bars are the uh, percentage of active nests in a given year. And uh, you can see that some years, the percentage of active nests like in 99, 2005 is low. And this interestingly enough coincides with the years in which there was uh, low fruiting in some of these years. Also, it coincides with the period uh, with El the El Nino. 
these years were the El Nino years when there is, a, a, you know, usually often a drought. And uh, in many other uh, tropical systems, they have found that, you know, in, during El Nino years, there's a low fruiting. I do not have data on all of the years which there's low fruiting because we began our uh, phenology monitoring again from 2009. But now we have... have enough data points to look at kind of interesting. The other thing I wanted to show you is that, you know, because hornbills are secondary cavity nesters and they, you know, um, seal the nest cavity, which is a unique uh, thing among birds, it is, um, it probably evolved, uh, you know, to avoid predation. So if a hornbill nests out of the active nests, the uh, we also, so, so we get what is the uh, nesting success. So uh, nests where the chick has fledged uh, are the ones which are considered to be a success, right? So generally, uh, 90% the average nesting success over the, that might vary in some years, but it usually ranges from, you know, 70 uh, 60 percent, you know, to 100 uh, percent, even in some years, of of the nest that we definitely could monitor and could check, you know, the activity till the end. Um, so one of the things that we've done, I've done, I did with the data is to just look at how, how many chicks have fledged in the 18 years that we estimated based on our nest monitoring, and an average of 14 chicks a year. Uh, you know, uh, being produced. Of course, this is within a confined area inside the park. It's but it just gives us an nest for monitored and uh, active, and you know, were successful over the years. An average of fourteen chicks a year were produced. The change in the timing of nesting that we've noticed. Uh, okay, so you'll have to look at this table carefully. So uh, the nesting cycle uh, is the length of the nesting cycle for the from the female entry to the chick exit. And that's 121 days for the great hornbill. This is only part of the data. Huh? It's not the entire data set. Um, then this is uh, the wreathed hornbill. And this is the oriental pied hornbill, which is 94 days. So this is the range. Uh, the next column is the range and the median date you can see for the Great Hornbill, the median date of nest entry is 17th March and for the wreathed Hornbill it's 15th March and for the Oriental it's later in April. Now if you see the entry dates in the next column, in the second last column, the entry dates ranged quite widely from 97 to 2016, okay, but they always were in March. Right. So, um, but in 2017, suddenly the nesting of the great hornbill and the wreathed hornbill was 29 days earlier than what was noticed in the previous so many years. And that was very, very unusual for us. It didn't happen with the oriental pied hornbill. And this is the same thing sort of showed graphically you can see that the range of nesting dates are, you know, within the first week of March to April for Great Hornbill. But you can see that in suddenly in 2017, there is this bar which shows that the Hornbills nested almost a month earlier. And if you recall the fruiting tree graph that I showed you, I showed you that fruiting uh, seems to have shifted to earlier period. So I don't know if the Hornbills are sort of adapting uh, easily, uh, adapting to this kind of change in the fruiting pattern. Now, this is just one year, right, 2017. So next, what happened is we wanted to write it up but as a paper. But then, you know, there's a lot of delay in all this and writing up an analysis. And then suddenly, um, and then we had two years more of data. But now if you see that in 2018, so it was, may have been an anomalous year, but is the pattern changing? So in 2018, the uh, nesting was again back in the normal range, okay? 
Uh, but in 2019, again, the nesting started a bit earlier, but not as early as 2017. But interestingly, we did not see any change in, I expected that, okay, they've nested early in 2017. So maybe it will affect their length of the nesting cycle, or maybe the, you know, success will be poor, but nothing uh, like that really happened in 2017. However, in 2019, five, uh, you know, 50% of the great hornbill nests failed. And we've never seen that happen before. So many great hornbill nests failed and we couldn't tell the reason why inside the park. So, uh, you know, there is still, uh, <coughs> so you wonder what is, you know, going on in terms of the, um, uh, you know, in, in initially, if you just look at the data for a, in the beginning, you might think, oh, okay, you know, hornbills are, uh, the timing has changed and it might be related to the fruiting patterns which have changed and they are doing okay, they're adapting. But then if you look at 2019 data, um, it doesn't seem to be there, you know, there could be some factor that is causing the nests to be abandoned and uh, unsuccessful. So we don't know what's going on. Okay, the other thing that you can get with long term data is this whole uh, competition uh, that's happening interspecific because you can't identify individuals some nests for 20 years. Now, if it's just used by a great horn, wouldn't be able to say whether it's the same some specific marks on the cask or whatever but if you um, if it's between a species we could we can make out right so what happened is there was a nest that we discovered in 97 uh, sorry 98 reed thornbill nest this was during my phd study and for so many years it was used by a reed thornbill then in 2003 or 2004 there was a big uh, fight between a pair of great hornbills and a wreathed hornbill pair and then nobody got the nest <laughs> because it's like you know a dog in the major the great hornbill who fought for it he didn't nest so it remained inactive for two years and then in 2006 it was taken over by great hornbills for two years it was used by great hornbill then again it was taken over by a wreathed hornbill for several years, nests, which is still active. So I just wanted to say that with long-term data, you can really know a lot of all this, uh, these interactions and things that are going on at these nests. The other thing that we've learned from our long-term monitoring is, is that hornbills also have a lot of competitors at the nest cavities, especially the smaller hornbill, the oriental pied hornbill, uh, because it uses smaller cavities, which are used by a lot of other whole nesting birds like the great slaty woodpecker, the red breasted parakeet, then the hill miner, and sometimes these also take nests of reed hornbills or uh, even the larger species. In some other areas, the you know flying squirrels, uh, uh, parquet flying squirrels are not so common. For some. So the, the other thing that we come to know about uh, nest turnover. So for instance, 40% uh, of some of our nest trees are now inactive in the last five years. Percent of our nest trees. And this is all natural reasons. Huh? This is not a cut or you know, due to fire. This is inside the tiger reserve, which is quite well protected. And uh, now 10 of the 19 nest trees we, uh, we know have been tracked for greater than 12 years, while five out of eight nests that have been tracked more than 20 years are also still active. So it tells you that, you know, the longevity of nest trees. And uh, so, you know, we could get at how many average years is a nest active. And that's approximately 11 years based on our data. Why are some nests not used? You know, apart from 
uh, other reasons why birds pairs may not breed every year there is uh, nests may have problems which results in uh, them not being used anymore i mentioned already about other birds or other creatures taking over the nest cavity uh, sometimes which results in nobody nesting um but there's also physical reasons why nests are not used so sometimes a nest cavity can uh, be damaged inside so the floor can be sunken there can be water seepage coming in from uh, you know places and all that there can be also the hole can uh, narrow and close um in some cases it might be the opposite it might widen too much sometimes there might be a bad like no perching proper perching for the uh, bird to be able to feed the male so also not all uh, pairs may be breeding every year which might be related to age or fruit availability patterns so one of the things that our team did in 2015 um well i had learned how to be climbing long back in thailand and then i got too fat and um unfit to be able to do it properly anymore so we tried uh, we it in uh, like we are being a nest repair the thai uh, the thailand hornbill project has done this for many years and they're very skilled at it that is kem one of our field staff who's amazing and this is um, pay one of the thais who's teaching him and this is up 20 meters up in the canopy and so several of our team and our nest protectors also learned how to uh, do this and uh, so basically this is the inside of a hornbill nest cavity and uh, here is uh, taring outside and he is this cavity was too narrow and so what we did is we widened it for the hornbill and it was not being used right so uh, this is one active you know we got into doing this for a few uh, some of the nests in the area in another case we um, we've uh, so we in, in the last 2 3 years we've repaired about 13 nests 10 of which were used and out of those 10 i think about 7 were successful nesting um so in this case what happened is the reef tonbill didn't have a proper place to perch when it's feeding you can have to fly away and sit on another bird and then come back again so what the thai guys helped us to do is to put a kind of a perch on the uh, near the nest cavity and so later the next uh, breeding season the bird uh, used that to perch and it's still active and being used this was done in 2017 um and that is ken uh, on one of the nest trees which he had to so one of the things that you have to do in some of these nest trees is to fill up the if the floor of the nest cavity is sunken you have to fill it up with soil so in some of the nest cavities we had to fill up to i don't you know i think up to 50 kilos maybe of soil um so it's quite a big task to do all this and uh, this was um, you know taught by the thai team and that is ot who is a very very skilled uh, thai uh, researcher who's like a master at climbing and doing all this and one of the things that you have to do when you climb up into the canopy is first you have to check the cavity for if it has any other occupants like so you have to carry a rag which is kind of light it to check whether the um, uh, you know if it smokes i mean just to make before you put your hand in or look in to check that and so it's quite risky to do all this and so by the way this is of course all done in the non breeding season when the nests are not uh, in use and uh, yeah this is another interesting story of a nest which was uh, found in 2009 and there's some great pictures actually taken by very good photographers like sandesh and kalyan of this uh, of a hornbill at its nest but um, in now uh, two three years ago we noticed that there was a lot of climbers covering the cavity and the cavity was closed uh, with you know the climbers on, on top of it and the
because you know a lot of it, it's uh, so very expert climber they um, you know in uh, in the uh, in 2018 winter season they climbed uh, sartaj climbed this nest tree and he sort of removed these climbers the previous year our staff had cleared up all the extra climbers around this uh, for 2 3 years the hornbills had not been using it and then in 2008 that's uh, you know really uh, you know happy news for us the other thing that we tried to do in the last two years was um, also to look at especially because uh, you know our data suggests that cavities are limiting for hornbills and also just as an experiment experimental thing forest is very big uh, you know experimentally uh, literature because there's been a lot of uh, different designs done for hornbills in other areas in southeast asia and in south africa and also um, you know with some advice from tanatapi as well as so he oyon vanity he makes models and sculptures and stuff so he tried this out for us so we uh, made some six nest boxes which were placed up uh, uh, you know four of them have been placed up till now up in the canopy up to 15 20 meters high and it's been one year or one and a half years of course and now uh, this year our staff are trying to monitor it more regularly to see if there's any bird activity or if anybody is visiting it at all to uh, it usually uh, it, it doesn't uh, you know nest cavity acceptance is not immediate um these are made of fiberglass uh, and these are relatively light compared to the nest boxes that are made uh, you know have been made in other places uh we are not sure whether they'll be accepted yet but it's you know it's it's a more experimental effort um so we might change things based on what we see uh happening we've not yet been able to monitor the the nest boxes we've put up regularly uh but this season they are trying to do that although work was stopped for a while because of the lockdown um okay so um yeah so with nest you know this is some of the active nest management that we've been trying to do with repairs i feel that repairs are much more useful than trying nest nest boxes um for a variety of reasons um but uh the so now i'm just moving on to our conservation work uh some of our conservation work as all of you know i uh, mean hunting is quite a large problem in arunachal and much, much of some, some parts of the northeast and uh, you know in the western arunachal the nishi community wears the great horn bills upper beak uh, on their you know these cane cap this podum and this you know so uh, it was it it has been used in the past a lot uh, although now people have changed uh, many people in many areas have changed to using fiberglass beaks uh, which was started by wti and the forest department in some areas especially in pake feathers are also used by tail feathers of great horn bills are also prized by some communities in eastern arunachal pradesh which is the you know one chot tribe in uh, eastern arunachal pradesh mainly the uh, noktes also and they value the tail feathers the tail feathers can cost even up to 600 rupees or 1000 rupees nowadays um so one of the common sights in many of these areas is seeing hornbill heads these are pictures from much earlier in the past and um uh so in households displayed right so hunting was a is a a big threat to hornbills and even uh, so despite the fiberglass beaks being used i mean even in sometimes in the government emporia you can see that the casks of the real hornbills are also being sold and often they are sold at a higher price than that of the uh, artificial ones so there is still some demand for the uh, real beaks among people the other threat the hornbills face uh, is a uh, habitat loss due to logging and you know conversion of 
plant to agricultural or other crops and all that. So one of the things that happened in the area adjoining um, Pocket Tiger Reserve, especially towards the Assam side, is a huge amount of deforestation between, in the last 20 years. And it's documented, very well documented, that Shonipur district had the highest deforestation rates anywhere in the country. And around 400 square kilometers or more was lost in that uh, landscape. Now, in the Arunachal part of it, in the um, area which is adjacent to Pake Tiger Reserve, the uh, degradation was less than you know, what happened in Assam, but it was still getting degraded compared to the, uh, the status of the forest in the Tiger Reserve. This is, you know, this picture is taken inside the reserve forest and overlooking the Pake River, and on the other side is the uh, Tiger Reserve. Same, another picture showing the settlements and uh, areas in, in the, near the Papu Muarif. Now, so, that park is like greater than 1,000 square kilometers. And Namiri is this side, and you know, over here below is some of those uh, totally uh, you know, disappeared reserve forests of Assam. Now, Hello, Rajita. Hello, Mahesh. Can you call her and maybe? Yeah. Has she dropped again? No, she is there. We can still. Ah. Also. Sound is gone. Yeah. Is everything okay? Now she ah, is dropped. Okay, ha. Huh. I think the power might have come back. She might join. So, so guys, I, I think till that moment we will declare the results. Yeah, yeah. Please declare the uh, the results in the meanwhile. I hope everyone is enjoying the session a lot. I can see a lot of very very intense questions coming. Hi. Ha. Ah. So she's back. Hello. I I've been here only. Oh. Uh, Acha. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Share your okay. screen, no problem. Yeah, huh. yeah. My screen is gone, is it? Yeah, share screen is gone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Here. Okay, yeah. So, uh, um, can you re repeat so the back a, uh, you know, we... Aprajita, can you go back a slide, please? And repeat from there. We missed you there on that. Okay, to the map. Shall I go? One more, one more, please. Yeah, we did. We didn't see this at all. Hello. Shall I go? One more slide, please, Aprajita. Hello. Yeah, that's good. Can you hear? We can't hear you. Your voice is garbled. Hello. Ah, now clear. Hello. Okay. Double because I'm. I don't know what. Wait, wait. Ah. Oh. Now it's clear. Now it's clear. Go on. Okay. So now the thing is that you know. So what I was trying to say is that hornbills move over large areas, right? To them, there are no boundaries, and 862 square kilometers is the area of the tiger reserve, but there's a larger area of the reserve forest. 
but the reserve forest parts of it are were extremely degraded or, or disturbed. And even though we knew some nests inside the reserve forest prior to 2011, we uh, most of the time the information was that they were abandoned or the trees would, you know, uh, get cut eventually. We thought of beginning uh, this map is the same map, but I just showed it it's because it's interesting one made by Arjun. Yeah, <laughs> it's very nice map. because it shows all the most of the anti-poaching camps, uh, which have been established by, you know, Tanata Sir in the park. And it shows the villages uh, in the reserve forest. Hello. Oops. May I quickly announce the results? I think Aprajita, she's showing she's here, but. Yeah, I'm back. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, now the main internet is back. Okay. It's not anymore on my hotspot. Okay. okay. You want to announce the results? You go ahead. No, go no, ahead. no. We can do that later. We were just trying to keep okay. the audience uh, okay. occupied. You can share, yeah, your, yeah, yeah. Sure. share your screen. Sure, go sure. ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, share my screen. Wait. Yeah. So, the, um, so, that, that, so then we, you know, we thought of establishing a kind of partnership with the department. We had meetings with the department and the Gurabi Society. We broached this idea to them, which is basically a copy of what uh, Dr. Pillai Punswad has also done in Thailand for many years. Uh, basically, it's called the Hornbill Nest Adoption Program. And uh, the idea is that, wait, I'll go forward. Huh? The idea is that people adopt a Hornbill family, that is citizens anywhere, and become a parent, a foster parent for Hornbills. And... Uh, um, they give, they, uh, you know, support uh, the project to, uh, you know, monitor, in a monetary, uh, like with monetary support. And uh, why was there the need for this program? So while in the park, there were no threats to the nests. We had analyzed our data for 10 years and we realized that, you know, the nesting failures were not, were always usually due, all due to natural causes. There was hardly any nest that was, uh, you know, uh, affected because of any hunting or any dogging or, you know, any cutting inside the park. But simultaneously, what was happening is that the lowland forest in Assam had gone. Then there was increased direct competition, nest takeovers for nests, which I talked about earlier. Then uh, there was extensive hornbill habitat outside the park in the RF, but those nest trees were being lost. So we wanted to protect the nests outside, which were more vulnerable. And that's why this partnership. So basically, what do donors give and what do they get? So there are three species available for adoption. So, well, technically, there's a fourth species, rufous necked hornbill. But in the last so many years, unfortunately, we've not been able to find a single rufous necked hornbill um, in the area where we have been uh, searching. And that's because rufous necked hornbills are a bit harder to find around Pake uh, in the Papuma RF because they're in a slightly higher elevation areas. And the uh, nest protectors um, who work uh, live in the lower villages, right? So when we search for rufous neck hornbill, it's usually an expedition to go and look for them. And we've made some attempts, but we, it's not something that we can monitor on a regular basis. So, um, so basically donors uh, can donate and it's tax exempt. And uh, the salaries of nest protectors, this is a lower number than now. Actually, they get much more now. They get 10,000 uh, rupees per month from this year. 
and uh, the local coordinator is a person who uh, supervises and oversees all the nest protectors. With the money, we buy equipment for the nest protectors like binoculars and cameras and other stuff. And uh, some of the money is also used to um, contribute to some village uh, welfare activity every year, which is decided with uh, amongst the partners. Oh. Um, so donors can also visit Pake. We also give annual updates to donors, which are, you know, reports, um, as well as we have a Facebook page. So the benefits is that, you know, there's direct community involvement, there's employment for some interested villagers and, uh, you know, village welfare funds are also given uh, for uh, various activities uh, in that area. Then uh, there's new nests of hornbills that are being found and protected in the reserve forest and we're also getting long-term ecological data and it's like an opportunity to address the challenges in the area so this is how the nest adoption program was set up and so hornbills have three sets of parents basically and so there's there were three partners initially then in the last in 2016 or 17 we also uh, had a four have a fourth partner which is the Pake Paga hornbill festival committee i will come to that later why how it came up so hornbills basically have three sets of parents, the real biological parents, hornbills themselves, as well as, I mean, the parents and the local guardian, that is the, you know, um, local person who was, may have been a hunter in some of these cases. And uh, the other is the um, far away urban citizen, you know, who is supporting. But you know, I want to tell you that in the last so many years, we've had many, many rural people from Arunachal, Nishi people also, who have supported the program. And that's really heartwarming, you know, uh, including, uh, you know, some of these uh, uh, women's uh, self-help groups and others. Um, so this was the team when we first set it up in 2012. Um, uh, sitting right there is uh, in the middle is Tana Tapi with the hat. And these were some of the nest protectors at that time and the Gora Abe Society chairman and Amruta who was um, uh, helping in, in that stage in the program, in the initial stages when we began. This is the team in 2017, it kept changing. We have different people, some, uh, you know, sadly one of our nest protectors also passed away. Um, uh, then uh, there's a woman also who was a nest protector for a while. This is the team in 2019. And some of them are quite elderly and he was a big hunter before, but uh, he's in his seventies, but extremely dedicated and uh, will go on foot in barefoot uh, to protect his nest. In fact, from this year onwards, we are trying to think of, you know, retiring him because he's not, uh, he's not able to, but there's a lot of other younger people. And this low, low, the person in the lowest picture is Tajik Tachang. He's our coordinator very very capable and very very uh, intelligent and um, you know wonderful uh, coordinator um, so there are 11 of them now and basically during the breeding season from uh, in the start in January February which is the pre-breeding period they start monitoring the known nests and start looking for new nests in the reserve forest area so each group they, they form some groups or pairs and they uh, monitor uh, certain nests which are de uh, designated to them in their locality, in, the, in more near their, their area. Some of them have to go far because the nests might be far further away. And in the, because we pay them year round now, they also work in the non-breeding season. What they do is they count hornbills at the roost sites. Uh, and they also walk transects in the reserve forest to count hornbills to estimate uh, encounter rates or densities later. So we have uh, about two, three years of data on the abundance of hornbills in, in the reserve forest. And you know, very interesting information from the roosting sites. So we know about 24 roosting sites along the edge of the Pake Tiger Reserve and this boundary area in the, near the rivers, which the team of nest protectors is able to monitor throughout the year. So the, uh, you know, in the reserve forest, this is showing the data from the nest that we found in the reserve forest of the three species. And as you can see in the first few years, we found uh, some great and wreathed hornbill nests, but mostly in later years, it was oriental pied hornbill. 
So this is just the cumulative number of ne new nests that we found over the years. And again, you know, it's just showing that great and uh, wreath hornbills, uh, not that many after the first couple of years because the area is very, very degraded uh, in some parts, uh, there is a forest. And so it's a more suitable habitat for oriental pied hornbills now. Um, although there are a few great and wreath hornbills nests still. And also I wanted to say that um, oops, in the last whatever, so many, from 2012 when we began the program to now, uh, we've got totally to 47 nests in the reserve forest. 12 trees have been lost. In the only the first year, we lost two trees which were cut down, three uh, were lost in fire. But other than that, we've not lost any due to disturbance or human related causes, thankfully, till now. Um, some of them fell due to natural uh, storm and Causes. And some are inactive for some years because the cavity is not uh, suitable anymore. So this map shows you the nests of the three different species in the reserve forest. So uh, as you can see, our area of work is limited to near and around the villages. We've done some, uh, you know, the team has done some small expeditions in some months to look for nests of the rufous neck in the higher areas towards the Takochini and these areas, but uh, we've not yet found any uh, rufous neck hornbill nests. And actually we are constrained because they have to collect the data for the nests, you know, during the breeding season here. So if they go off, you know, to other places, um, it doesn't work very well. Um, this again, this graph is just showing the distribution of hornbill nests uh, in the reserve, uh, in the Taika Reserve versus the Papum uh, Reserve Forest. And again, it shows that the, there's a greater person, you know, in the, if you see in the tiger reserve, which is blue, there's um, almost equal percentages it reached an oriental pied hornbill nest in the Pakke tiger reserve. Actually, oriental is the least, uh, you know, but you see the difference in the Papum RF, there are much more oriental pied hornbill nests. And that just indicates the kind of habitat, the degradation. You can see this picture of the habitat on the left. Uh, which is more uh, open and uh, yeah. Although some higher parts of the reserve forest is very good forest. Um, the other thing is, this is a comparison. I had shown you the uh, activeness and nesting success graphs of over the long-term data from 97 to uh, 2019. This is a different thing. It's showing the percentage of activeness comparing between the Papu Maref and the Pakke Tiger Reserve. But so what you can see is that the uh, percentage of nests that are active out of the known monitored nests in the RF is lower than in the tiger reserve. And this is probably because some nests, uh, there might be more levels of, you know, degradation, disturbance and stuff. So, you know, not all nests can be used uh, every year inside the reserve forest. Um, and likely that, you know, it's more... Uh, possible to use it in the park. Similarly, nesting success. So nesting success, it's very interesting that despite being more degraded and uh, being more in the villages with people and all that, um, and through our monitoring and our protection, I mean, the nesting success is quite high in the reserve forest, although the average nesting success is a little lower than in the tiger reserve. But as you can see, it's 80% of nests are successful um, on average. Um, so again, similarly in the reserve forest in the seven, eight, I mean, what, nine years of the program that we've had, we've had so many chicks that have fledged uh, outside in the park. This is our estimate, uh, 33 great hornbill, 17 wreath hornbill chicks and 87 oriental pipes. These are the pictures, by the way, taken by our nest protectors of some of the chicks. In the first few years, we did not have uh, the ability to give good cameras to all our team. And some of them are pretty old, you know, and they're not used to all this, you know. So we, I would give them smaller cameras, point and shoot ones. But, you know, now many of them are very keen and they want better cameras and they're really like enthusiastic about going and sitting at the nest and they actually try to get more reliable data on the nest exit and the chicks with the, when they have the cameras.
because that gives them a you know a greater motivation there's a lot of fighting about oh this guy's got a better camera the other one doesn't have so um, you know so these are some of the pictures taken by the nest protectors themselves uh, of the chicks that have uh, fledged um oh, what happened to this graph something happened but anyway it's okay i've shown you so many graphs it doesn't matter but basically why why did why is it not visible i don't know uh i was showing you the number of successful nests uh, across three different species but it's okay I, it's it's not visible for some reason so currently just to sum up there are 11 nest protectors at one point we had 17 but due to various fa factors now we work with 11 and uh, we have they are from six villages in that surrounding area and right now there are 37 hornbill nests which are uh, you know there and the team has uh, was nominated uh, for a sanctuary asia award in 2014 and then 2016 uh, you know was given an india biodiversity award oh this has come again no so i mean so a lot of the nest competition uh, stuff that you uh, you know we recorded was from the rf where we have a lot more oriental pied nests um, which i said you know were being occupied by uh, you know several oriental pied hornbill nests were occupied in some years by great shady woodpecker and parakeets and bill miners and bees now switching quickly to some of the roosting data that we have from the area is uh, you know showing that the reed thornbill which roosts in uh, large communal flocks especially in the winter months in the non breeding season you can see the huge numbers that are coming to one of the roost sites now this one's very interesting because it is in the village okay so when i did my phd work i found roosting uh, uh, you know on the assam arunachal border on a near a bridge and this site was being used for many years till 2014 or sometime 15 16 they started uh, the the bridge area got really disturbed by people and a lot of the trees had been cut down uh, towards the assam side so maybe because of that and maybe because people don't hunt hornbills anymore or they don't disturb them anymore the hornbills have now started regularly using a roost site which is just across our base camp and we used to joke that you know they've come they're following us wherever we go like you know to the, because we moved to our base camp and then they were again still roosting behind us um, so this is data which is recorded continuously from uh, the last 4 5 years but it's interesting in 2019 you know for a long period there was a lot of um, hornbills coming and roosting but uh, uh, i don't know why uh, the numbers were not so high in september october or winter of uh, you know um, 2009 uh, sorry so january yeah so january 2018 to part of 2019 it was very good but then again it has has gone down the numbers and we don't know what these fluctuations are related to um the other unique thing which was you know fascinating for me when i first began working like nobody really knew that so hornbills you know don't roost although our telemetry data has shown that individual hornbills do sometime do roost solitarily in in uh, inside the forest a large person some percentage of the population especially reed hornbills um come and roost in large flocks even in the breeding season you know although the numbers are much higher in the non breeding season because naturally 50% of the birds are inside the nest no females which are nesting are inside the nest in the breeding season so they are not available to roost but in the non breeding season it's the the males female the pairs as well as the juveniles and uh, all the birds you know the non breeding um, in, um, individuals who come and roost in big flocks um, outside um this is the roosting data from another site which was again possible to monitor because of all these nest protectors who can monitor simultaneously you know uh, throughout the year you know for these birds and again it's very interesting that in 2019 uh, over here also there was a large number that was roosting between september and october and it's very sad but here we know i think why they are not roosting in large numbers anymore 
is because along the, on the riverbed there was some uh, stone crushing and you know this uh, riverbed uh, you know stone extraction that started happening uh, close to the roosting site and uh, i believe that it could be the reason why uh, you know they're not being uh, they're not using it in large numbers this year uh, and uh, so that's one thing so the nest protectors, you know, I said in the first few years, there was a lot, some nests which were lost to due to fire because in March, April, this area is quite, uh, you know, although it's uh, Arunachal Pradesh and one would think it's a tropical semi-evergreen forest and all that, but some parts of the area, especially in the Southeastern part, is quite dry at times in March, April, when it's the dry season and when it's, you know, the leaves are, many of the trees, deciduous trees are leafless. So it's quite fire prone at that time. So the, uh, you know, we figured along with Tanatapi's advice, so around the nest trees, they clear vegetation during the start of the breeding season a little bit so that the fire doesn't affect the base of the nest tree or, you know, affect nesting because we lost nest trees to fire. So this was Tade Talk. He's now retired. He was amazing. He was, you know, so keen to save his nest tree. He would take water in these water bottles to try to douse the fire. So I talked about the deforestation that has happened. And so this is the Assam uh, the, from Arunachal Pradesh looking to the Assam side in Sunitpur district. All that area has gone uh, in the past. Um, by 2005 or 2002, this area was mostly gone. But one of the big challenges we are still facing in the reserve forest inside Papum is illegal logging, which is happening in the um, inside the Arunachal side now for the especially stronger in the last two, three years. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because it is not something that can be maybe discussed in great detail in, a, you know, in such a public talk. Uh, but we are fighting with about it with very, in various ways. And, you know, fortunately, many of you may know that there is a you know, um, another one, he was a part of the Parque Pagahon Festival Committee. But the local uh, niche conservation activist has really taken it upon himself, Toto Tana, to fight this illegal logging. And that's really um, helpful, you know, for uh, this area. To uh, Although we've not lost, lost any nest trees to the illegal logging yet, but our uh, analysis uh, with one, my, one of my colleagues here, uh, Chintan, we've just published, we're going to be publishing a paper. We found that around one kilometer radius of the nest trees, we've lost quite a bit of the uh, forest cover, despite the existence of the nest adoption program. So it's been quite challenging to um, you know, address this. And, um, but despite that, the program is going on and uh, you know, it has been partially successful, I would say. Uh, we've had 200 citizen donors totally in the last so many years, which is not much. Um, but we've not always pushed for it so hard. So um, we've also fortunately, as the program became better known, we also got support from several European and uh, zoos in the US. And uh, also, you know, Maitreya, I think he was, I saw him in the talk. <laughs> he was one of the donors. Uh, he managed to get um, many people in his school to donate several years ago. And uh, I think he wants to try again to help us. He had visited Pake. Um, that's his picture when he was much younger, I think. Um, okay, I, I've gone on too long. So you guys might want to tell me to stop because I have a lot more. But I'll uh, just say that we also started a restoration program um, as we realized that, you know, the habitat is going outside, we, we began a restoration program in 2014. And these are just some of the numbers and what we've done till now. Um, we've planted an area of 13 hectares only. That's not much, maybe according to many of you, but it's uh, with a small team. And the basic thing is that the nursery, we have 75 native tree species that we've grown. Uh, so many saplings over these years. And uh, we've also uh, we also grow these economically important, ecologically important species, right? So these are all native. Uh, many are bird dispersed, wind dispersed, whatever, uh, hornbill dispersed species. But we also distribute to local villagers because uh, we feel that it's better that people grow it near their home gardens and use it 
eventually they are interested in a few of the important timber species so as long as they are growing it and cutting it you know 10 15 20 years later it's it's better than you know them taking it from the um cutting it from the forest so this is our nursery now earlier we had another place as a nursery now we have a bigger space and this is some of our nursery staff and the researchers working and the we are you know uh, nursery potting the bags then making tags for the seedlings which we are going to plant so some of the sites where we have uh, uh, done small like you know usually our patches are 1 hectare or smaller even so some of the sites were outside in the elephant corridor area in doimara rf next to to be uh, in uh, the tiger and uh, um, adjacent outside in the tiger reserve one of the sites is in an abandoned village site so this is the only village that was once relocated from uh, relocated uh, people from uh, pakke uh, in 93 so there there's an abandoned uh, area there which is uh, not regenerated very well so we did some planting there another place is a degraded patch inside the tiger reserve so one of the things is originally our plan was to restore more areas outside in the rf but there's a lot of uh, ownership and legal issues in doing uh, restoration in that area which have not been fully sorted out we in the first year we did some planting around the nestries uh, and a little bit other places but we've not been able to do it on a large scale in the reserve forest except on the uh, tp side in the rf which was not large scale also it was the other place where we uh, so this is some of our team you know i mean in pakke it's not easy to um, do restoration in some of the areas because you have to carry the saplings they're quite heavy we also grow the saplings at least for two years we try to grow slightly taller ones to plant in the forest because we don't want to plant the really small ones which don't survive very well uh, so then uh, sometimes we have to uh, in the monsoon before the monsoon or during the monsoon if you have to do it to carry it quite long distance uh, uh, you know and it's quite a back breaking work so this is some of the team doing that some of so since we started in 2016 some of the saplings have grown really tall that some of our staff and i hope and i believe that you know before i'm uh, like you know 70 or 80 before i die i'll see some of the trees actually fruiting and uh, this is rohit in one of the um, other restoration sites so we also did some restoration in not restoration i mean it's in uh, t estates in assam many of them have set aside areas where they want to do some restoration of native species so we've done that in some of the places uh, this is in dekia juli one of the ts states and uh, then we've done it in another place called mijika uh, and in these uh, areas because it's managed much more and it's protected from grazing and all that the survival is really high you know in these uh, uh, ts state sites uh, that's shivi my son pretending to read a kindle while uh, i have wanted to say him to stand there to you know see how tall it. so this is one you know sapling that's grown that much in one year in this uh, you know it's really fast the growth um okay um maybe i should skip this part huh so there was some stuff about the distribution of hornbills and their occupancy across northeast india i don't know whether you guys want to listen to so much of all this but basically we wanted to check the so we knew a lot about arunachal right but we didn't know what was the status of hornbills in some other states in northeast india so nagaland meghalaya tripura mizoram and uh, one more assam we did this survey and we had these grids uh, i was used uh, we did use an occupancy framework the idea was to look at habitat use probability and the change so it was based on interviews with villagers in across all these areas and asking them about presence of hornbills in the past and the current 1993 and 2013 20 years you know and we did this selection of grids based on um elevation and uh, uh, you know uh, the ndvi that is you know the green uh, cover kind of index so what happens when you do these rapid field surveys across larger areas is that hornbills may be there but you don't see them so much right you can come away saying that oh hornbill abundance very low it may be true but uh, the effort may not be enough to say that right so uh, 
So while we did the field surveys, the data that we got was very limited. We got only four great hornbill sightings and 31 oriental and other species were not detected with the field survey. So that interview surveys serve this other purpose of trying to determine this occupancy and distribution through the knowledge of um, local people and hunters and other uh, you know, knowledgeable people. And this was led again by Rohit, uh, along with several other researchers who were part of that team at that time. So you can see that you know, basically after all our work, you can find that, see that great hornbill habitat use probability uh, is highest in the areas which are already kind of these protected area kind of islands. In the rest of the landscape, the habitat use probability is very low. And so the overall uh, estimate of the area that you know the great hornbills may have in that northeastern in these states is only around 7,000 square kilometers. Reef hornbill, same, same situation, I mean, even worse actually. So um, then Rufus Necht, as you can see, is almost, you know, like in Nagaland, there's only this eastern part of Nagaland where Reef Thornbill has a high probability of, uh, of you know, yeah. occurrence. Uh, then uh, the Oriental Pied Hornbill is doing okay. It has a much larger area, which is, you know, it's uh, across uh, where it could be found and is found. Whereas look at uh, brown hornbill. Brown hornbill has a very low probability of use generally. Like, so the highest is 0.41 to 0.45, you know, 50% probability of, uh, you know, so therefore it's really, really, it was hard to even say, you know, how much area it is uh, found across because it's so low. So, um, and this is one way to look at this 20 year change. Basically, this is showing the percentage of grids where hornbills were not reported in 2013. They were reported in 1990, uh, you know, that 20 years before, but not in 2013. So you can see that a large percentage of the grids did not have some of these, especially great and rufous snake and brown hornbill anymore uh, in 2013. Um, so hunting is an issue, again, across when they were doing the survey. So that's wild boar. Uh, you know, with, along with, you can see reef thornbill skulls, heads. Shifting cultivation, although in many areas, I believe shifting cultivation is a better land use than uh, commercial cash crop plantations and is better for biodiversity. In some areas where there is high density of uh, people or the fallow cycles are very short, you know, a lot of area has gone. Also another worry in the Northeast in many areas is that there's lots of rubber, there's lots of, um, in some places, oil palms also coming up. So these are monoculture plantations. So, and many, many, most often they're in the lowland forest areas, which are critical habitats for hornbills. So one of the things that the idea of that survey, after we did that survey, the idea was that we want to expand our work from Arunachal Pradesh to other sites where we also want to try and emulate the model of the nest adoption program, maybe in different ways, in different sites, not exactly the same way as in Pake. So one of the sites we chose was Jaipur, the Hingpatkai, especially for the brown hornbill. And Bhaskar Bora, he is a researcher, he is uh, leading that work in that site. Since 2017, we began work here, and we found some 11 nests of brown hornbill and a couple of nests of, uh, we totally are around 11 to 12 nests of mainly brown hornbills and a couple of nests of oriental. And this year, I think we've also got a great hornbill nest. Um, so um, I, I don't have time to go into the details of the work there, but this is just to tell you that we're working there. The other, another place that we identified was in Upper Siang uh, district in Arunachal Pradesh, very hard place to work and a lot of hunting there. And this, I mean, despite a lot of field effort and surveys and surveys using occupancy framework, hornbills are pretty, uh, hornbills are there, but they're very hard to detect because of possibly hunting. Maybe one has to go even further away from the villages to uh, see hornbills. So we've sort of not, um, we've not totally abandoned the plan here. Also uh, addressing hunting here is a very sensitive and difficult issue. So not really, you know, it, it requires a little more thought. Um, so that was one. Then Baksa Tiger Reserve in North Bengal, 
has been an amazing site to work in. Here we work in collaboration with Nature Mates, which is an organization based in Calcutta. And uh, it's been a great collaboration with them. So um, there's some very good uh, staff like Sita Ram, who is really amazing in his knowledge. And you know, there's been uh, two researchers who've worked, Orco, and then later Dollar is now working. So here we found uh, 18 nests of four species. In fact, this is the site where we have good data on rufous neck thornbill. So it's amazing. We have some six, seven nests of rufous neck thornbill from here. And uh, although so many of them are not successful, some uh, a couple of the years that we've monitored. Um, and Karishma is uh, joined us in February last year. So she is also coordinating work at this site and in, in Pake uh, with the HNAP. And uh, the, uh, here it looks very promising in terms of continuing the work in collaboration with the forest department because it's inside the tiger reserve. There is scope for you know improving protection for the nests and um, and we're also doing a lot more abundance estimation in this park uh, through both transects and using a grid-based approach. Um, some of that data is analyzed, but I'm not presenting all of that. So these are some of the chick pictures from uh, Baksa. And there's the chicks come out and the female is feeding the chick after it's come out. That's the rufous neck thornbill chick peeping out. And they come out during August. Huh? So the rufous neck thornbill nesting is very late. Huh? It is from April, late April, uh, first week of May. And that's why it's like really right in the middle of the monsoon. And many of the nests are really difficult to access during the monsoon. Also because it's in higher elevations and all that. So one nest, something strange happened last year, which is one leaf thornbill nest, which we were observing. Um, one, day, one day it was found that the female, you know, after a few days when they went to check it, the female was stuck outside, you know, the nest. Maybe its leg has got caught in the groove or something. They got eaten up by ants. They managed to find with the department's help, they, you know, like some people helped to get the word down. Uh, but, you know, there was no sign of the chick. So we don't know what happened. So another place where we have started work in uh, since July, uh, sorry, since October this year, uh, Monali uh, is in Shergaon Forest Division, which includes Eagle Nest Wildlife Sanctuary. So it includes, I mean, so there's also the community forest, the reserve forest areas. So she's been um, doing transects across the elevational gradient, looking for hornbills. So she's, I mean, uh, luckily she's got hornbills. It's not as bad as uh, uh, Upper Siam. But uh, we've not yet found any nests in this area. And also because the lockdown started from March you know, this year, uh, so she could not be doing uh, much field work after. So actually right now also she's stuck in the, uh, in the village since last uh, two, three months. Um, so apart from all this, uh, you know, all this other kind of work, we also have, um, you know, the Hornbill Park, the park, we also do some outreach work with people and all that and one of the things that we started in 2015 was this idea of the Hornbill, uh, Pake Paga Hornbill Festival which we had broached to the um, put up you know several people at that time in the community and then we formed this committee and then the festival started first festival happened in 2015 and uh, there have been a few editions of that and uh, fortunately it's something that was uh, immediately adopted by the people in the community. And in fact, you know, uh, it's more something that they uh, have, you know, uh, taken over and, you know, it's got a different character and whatever now, because people now own it. It's not something that only started by, you know, one organization or whatever. It's a much more bigger thing now. And uh, hopefully that helps create some kind of positive uh, awareness and, thing about hornbills. Um, the, over the years, I've also produced some different material, uh, outreach material for uh, related to hornbills. And um, some of these are some old books that I've written. And they're all available. Huh? So if any of you want uh, for your children or for any of your activities or education, they're all available for download also uh, from the NCF's website, um, the PDFs. Uh, we just recently created a brochure for the forest department on the hornbills of North Bengal so that the staff can use it to uh, 
understand about various aspects of hornbills. We also created some uh, posters which depicts the breeding cycle of all the five species of hornbills in Northeast India. And we also have something called Hornbill Watch, which some of you may have contributed to or know about. I know it's not been very super active or communicative, but we engage all the time with all of these uh, different things. I have a specific now. people to upload their uh, report their sightings and their pictures of hornbills um, and so it's been quite okay but you know of course there's eBird now so people do not want to do multiple and especially for a single species so but it's still uh, sort of continuing and we give if some published a paper on the data uh, over the till 2018 or so uh, but we'll be soon giving an update about what information has come out of this. And yeah, so I mean, if any of you who are listening want to adopt the hornbill nest and um, help the hornbills, the site on Albizia flower. This is when I made funding agency. I mean, I couldn't list, I mean, this is a different kind of talk, but there's a lot of other individuals, of course, who have helped all this work and the program, but yeah. And of course the forest departments of Arunachal Pradesh and several other states and uh, West Bengal. And all that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, sorry. Thank you, wow. I think that was a fantastic talk, Aprajita. <laughs> do, do you want to uh, stop your I screen sharing know. and start your uh, now? Yeah. Oh, sure, yeah. 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 There Please take a sip of water. There are loads okay. of questions. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just a minute. Huh? Um, wait, I'll start my video. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, I have to look in the chat thing. Yeah. Great. So uh, yeah. a lot, lot of people, of course, I think uh, some of the questions okay. that people have asked about how to adopt uh, or uh, a few questions were about... Uh, what are the besides the roles of you know monitoring the hornbills? What else Hello? do the watchers do? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Aprajita? Yeah. Now I can hear you. Yeah. So one of the questions was that besides one is that how do you recruit your watchers, the hornbill watchers? Hello. Can you hear me? Hello? Mahesh, hello? Aprajita, your screen's frozen. Oh. Hi. Uh, no, no, she's on mute. She's on mute. Yeah, can you uh, unmute I yourself, Aprajita? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah I did. Yeah. The question was that how do you recruit your uh, hornbill watchers and what besides uh, monitoring hornbills, what other uh, roles do they play? Any other tasks that they do? Okay, yeah. Sure. They, uh, we, so when we first began, we didn't choose the nest protectors. We yeah. asked the uh, partner to do it. I mean, otherwise, there's a lot of, there can be a conflict, right? So it was right. decided through village meetings and, you know, they have some process by which they uh, select. Over the year, of course, some individual people who showed interest, you know, they came up later and then we got permission to also have because they got some other work or job. I told you one person died, two people right. retired. So things like, you know, there's a lot of fluctuation. Right. Um, but we also, um, no, sorry. So, uh, and what do they do apart from monitoring? So their main other job is to protect, right? So I didn't go into that, sorry, but right. so they 
go and check the nest and they see if there's activity and disturbance around there. People are doing things, cutting, hunting, things like that, you know, so they report it. Now that's been a sort of mix, mixed bag because, you know, it's not really been, they don't have so much power. And that's been a key uh, drawback in terms of, originally we thought that the system would be that they would, uh, if they reported any disturbance and, uh, you know, problem, they would come back and report it to the Ghorabe Society as the forest department and there would be some joint action taken. But in, in field, in practice, you know, it's not often been very uh, good. Uh, and sometimes they have to fight the battle alone. Right. And so there's a lot of, sometimes there's conflict uh, with their own villagers. And these are, uh, you know, more difficult issues. And sometimes there's been some effort, but, you know, we also have to get the territorial division of the forest department involved in some of these uh, um, efforts. And, uh, yeah. So, uh one question by Nikhil was that, are there any diseases that you have encountered in hornbills? Oh, no. So we've not handled hornbills so much, no? Apart from when we tagged and caught them. And that was very right. brief. Uh, so, so in terms of threats, it would be... disease in the hornbills. Right. Uh, yeah. Kiran Srivastava had asked whether you all install cameras inside the nests. And there were several other uh, questions in terms of what is the girth of the size of the tree, where the nest is present. Have you all okay. uh, done any yeah. data on that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So the nest tree, nest tree characteristics, the girth is, you know, it can be anywhere between uh, 300 to 500, 600 centimeters. They're quite large trees usually for the great hornbills and the wreathed hornbills. Uh, I can't offhand remember, but yeah, we have lots of data on the, the girth of nest trees as well as other characteristics of the nest tree. Um, about the nest cameras, yeah, we really want to put, but you know, so there's two things. We want, we want to uh, put nest cameras outside the nest cavity so that we can automate the process of nest monitoring also. So that our field staff, uh, as well as nest, not the nest protectors, because it won't be feasible in the RF, but inside the park, we wanted to put these nest cameras, uh, I mean, uh, these camera traps, which are sort of, uh, can record the, uh, but we've had issues with, you know, because they're so high up. Right. So when you put it up, they move and, uh, you know, there's wind and all that. So you don't get the... Um, so, uh, because you know, otherwise it's very inefficient. Because our team has to keep on, you know, and you get and some, and you, many times you might miss the chick fledging. You might, you know, miss the. So that's one thing. We also wanted to put inside uh, for getting more reliable data on the number of eggs, clutch size, then you know, ha hatching uh, date and all that. Because that is all for us now. Hornbills and all is really known only from captive hornbills. Because for Asian forest hornbills, it's very difficult to do that invasive. Like you can't really know uh, when they've hatched, except you hear the calls of chicks when you're monitoring the nest. Um, but that's when you do intensive nest watches. You know? If you're sitting uh, for several hours and monitoring a nest, then you can hear the chick calls and uh, say, oh, okay. And, but the chicks may not start calling immediately after hatching no so it might be a few days so it's just a guesswork some of those parameters so for that we wanted to put nest cameras but it has to be it to be um, there you know in uh, thailand they've done it when they were doing some filming but it can cause disturbance so and also hornbills are extremely uh, like you know they just like peck at anything that they find inside the nest cavity so we had put, when we were started climbing these nest cavities and were measuring the nest cavities and uh, repairing them, in some nest cavities, I had put these uh, temperature, what are they called, yeah? Those hobo, what is it? Yeah, hobo temps or what is, there's some particular, eye buttons, yeah. I put eye buttons. They were very expensive and I had great difficulty getting them. But, uh, and we put them and then after the end of the season when, uh, you know, the staff climbed up to check and get them. We couldn't find some of them. The hornbill had like uh, just uh, thrown it somewhere, you know, so they're gone. So, um, yeah, so it was a big uh, problem. So I don't know how they did it in Thailand. In Thailand, they had done it, especially for a filming project. There's a lovely video of a great hornbill, uh, you know, the whole cycle 
you know, through the nesting cycle, the, the cameras recorded all the stages. So, yeah. So one of the questions that Saha had asked was, uh, do hornbills uh, fledge fewer chicks or nests now with a staggered or longer fruiting season than earlier with a more punctuated fruiting season? So, given that, you know, Saha has given that they, most of the, the larger hornbills usually fledge one chick only. So in terms of, you know, chick, uh, we can't look at that. There might be some other parameters that we need to look at to see whether there's some change that's happening, you know, in terms of, I thought it might be that the length of the nesting cycle may have, uh, you know, become different, but we don't see that yet. Uh, but given that hornbills, usually the larger hornbills only raise one chick, usually. This year, in fact, one of the, I'm sorry, last year, 2019, one of the great hornbills for the first time, we saw two chicks. One chick came out on 3rd July, and the next chick came on 16th July. So it's very weird, you know, because that is the year when five of the hornbill nests failed. I told you 50% of hornbill nests failed, but one nest suddenly produced two chicks after so many years. So it's, uh, I guess, um, and only, uh, so SARS, only in the smaller hornbills like brown hornbill or oriental pied hornbill, uh, they lay a few more eggs. You know, the clutch size can be bigger, but even in the brown hornbill and the oriental pied, generally it's one to two chicks. You know, at least in India, that's what we've seen. Um, in captivity and in uh, Thailand, uh, they've seen slightly the larger, um, you know, uh, a few, um, like more than two, two fledglings and all that. Uh, so Abhijit had asked one question earlier. He said the uh, 600 to 11,000 seeds per day per square kilometer you mentioned, is that per individual hornbill or is it overall population of that area? Uh, it is, uh, and uh, I think it's at the individual level. Okay. I have to go and, go and uh, yeah, I think it's at the individual level. It's not okay. at the population level. Yeah. Because Rohit was estimating based on, uh, you know, just per hornbill, what is the rate? at which they would be dispersing seeds. This is based on plots laid in the forest and looking at seed rain by hornbills. Anyway, I can go into that uh, detail later, okay. but yeah, it's not at the population level. No. Okay. <laughs> the, another question was that, uh, has the hunting pressure changed? And uh, yeah. is there are there more storms or like cyclonic things that you can see a lot of uh, nesting trees are uh, being uprooted? Is there any such evidence that you're finding? Um, no, not uh, nesting trees uh, lo lost because of more storms or anything. Um, but uh, in terms of, what was the first thing you said? Sorry, I missed that. that. Uh, hunting pressure, has it changed? Oh, over hunting the pressure. Yeah. So hunting pressure is very variable. No, So in the site where we work mainly, which is Bakke Tiger Reserve and the surrounding area, hunting has really gone down. Uh, almost, I would say, it's nil among the local Nishi people. But there were about three, four or five incidences in the last four, five years that we know of, which have happened. And it's all, most of all, almost all of them were related to outsiders in the sense that, you know, there are these IRBN, Indian Reserve Battalion camps, you know, near the border. So many of those people who are from other parts of uh, Arunachal or other states, they were involved in a few of those hunting incidences, but the local people are quite, uh, hunting is not a problem anymore in this area so much, but, uh, and they also have all these fines and, you know, other, um, if they find, uh, you know, no of a case, there is some usually attempt at action being taken at the community level for hunting. So, but, you know, it's uh, large parts of Arunachal, there are there is still hunting going on in uh, of hornbills in some areas it's bad some areas it's more better because of better awareness and more interest among people yeah, yeah. hey there's a hornbill behind you there's a headed <laughs> yeah. hornbill i can see <laughs> so uh, i think you've been on for two and a half hours now i'll i'll conclude with one question that i had yeah uh, which is sort of, you know, sort of several other questions that people had asked, I'll combine that, is that uh, yeah. in urban areas, especially several cities are losing their hornbills. And uh, mm. 
there are lots of changes in the plantations or campuses also. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think as a common citizen that people should, well, both uh, attitude-wise, how should there be a change to look at hornbill as a uh, landscape species, you know? Mm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, one of the biggest problems is this urbanization, no? I mean, our cities, many places, like in Bangalore itself, I see that so many, like it's just expanding, you know? I mean, we, we live in the part of the city which was actually in the boondocks and sort of uh, rural area 10 years ago. So we are also kind of encroachers, you know? I complain about the backyard plot which is uh, being constructed, but I, my plot itself is also... I think one, I mean, I don't know if that's a, I mean, it's a very, you know, you asked a very imp important and a difficult question to answer immediately. But I think that, uh, you know, if there's some movement by citizens to sort of educate the uh, decision makers, the policy, you know, people who are planning city, you know, building and the construction and the architect, I mean, even landscaping, you know, instead of planting all these horrible palm, you know, some, you know, if you can put, um, you know, native species, you know, and figs and, uh, uh, you know, the Indian grey hornbill and all this, like, they, they, they love, uh, you know, they're so associated with figs and all these things, right? So, um, but of course, one good thing, Anand, is that I'm hearing that some cities like, you know, Mumbai and some places, grey hornbills are really like being seen after, I mean, much more nowadays, no? In yeah, some places. Yeah. They are there yeah. yet sort of stuck in some pockets and they can yeah. be seen quite frequently. Yeah. Yeah. So I think a citizen science project, you know, where people can, like for sparrows they did, that people were yeah. contributing data of where yeah. they are finding yeah. and, uh, yeah. you know, making more awareness as to what trees they associate in yeah. those parts, etc. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, so, you know, like even, I, I mean, people also do this all the, in their driveways and all, people are always making concrete everything is concretized and all that. Yeah. So there's ways in which you can make the city more green and sort of have uh, like connectivity, you know, in patches, you know, so then maybe these birds can move, you know, not right. just hornbills, other frugivorous okay. birds also. Yeah. I can't, yeah, I mean, it's a good question, but I can't immediately yeah. Great. Uh, give you. Thank you so much, Aprajita. Yeah. Uh, Thanks that was so much. Fantastic, uh, in the sense that you've covered, like given, uh, I, I think what I'd like to say is that how mm. research, conservation research, you know, everybody mm. talks about research being very academic and publishing yeah. of papers, but how this has achieved the community to get involved, the whole landscape and the species to also be protected uh, and also raise questions or, you know, uh, awareness among, uh, I am sure media mm. must have covered a lot of the work that you'll have done uh, and films, books were written. So I think, you know, uh, research can really, uh, if done again for a long period of time, you've shown that, uh, a it, not not just tiger, but even a hornbill research uh, yeah. can really spawn uh, spawn out a lot of outcomes uh, at the community level, at the conservation level. So, thank you so much, and thank you for agreeing to. But speak. I, I I'm I'm very very negative and very very this thing about the conservation impact, yeah. And seriously, <laughs> I think it's a drop in the ocean what we are able to do uh, for you know in the larger. Context. I'm sure, uh, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. with listeners like uh, what you had today, if they then multiply the information yeah. and, yeah. Uh, you know, with an informed idea, you know, rather than having very rosy pictures about how small or how large uh, their uh, territories are, mm -hmm. uh, a park cannot probably protect a larger great, horn, uh, you know, uh, pied hornbill or something like that. So once people understand the scientific aspects behind it, then they'll be also able to plan, urban planners or even forest planners can then talk about protected areas and non-protected areas as, as to how these species can then be conserved in the larger picture. Yeah. yeah. And you know, one a small thing, you know yeah. that this thing, you know, I think even when, our, when we were MSc students, we realized that some of the most important habitats for some of these threatened species are outside. So if you see the roosting sites on hornbills are all outside. Outside, you know? yeah, exactly. I mean, they, they are in the park also, but yeah. a lot of the large uh, flocks that are seen. You remember Kamar, uh, you know, his work, he found that sw swamp deer was outside. So I'm saying, just saying yeah. that it's a much uh, larger landscape. We always partition, you know, yeah. between protected and non-protected areas. Anyway, thanks so much for calling me yes. and I yes. hope it was all okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> bye. Thanks. Thanks nice. everybody for listening.
ಹಲೋ ಮಹೇಶ್ ಹಲೋ Okay, she's gone. She's yeah. there. Yeah, you can declare the results. Well, great, 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 great. No, that was an amazing talk. I mean, so, wow. I mean, so as a researcher, even I got to learn a lot, of course, from a different field, but I came to know the importance and the factors, parameters, many aspects looking into it. I mean, it's amazing work. Uh, she's done it. Anyways, so thank you for all the participants to stay with us for... i mean so more than 2 hours amazing uh, we would like to declare our results you know in another whatever you know 5 minutes of time so uh, we had essay writing we had poetry writing we had uh, poster making and we had wildlife photography competition so winners of essay writing we have divided into two parts the hindi language and the hindi english language because we had essays in both the languages so essay writing in hindi language the first prize goes to chandra sen kori second prize goes to kalyani singh thakur and third prize goes to komal tiwari uh, congratulations to all of you uh, essay writing in english language the first prize goes to palguni sarkar the second prize goes to rushikesh tushar rege the third prize goes to vagendra shrivas uh, there are special mentions also uh, in the english essay writing the special mention first uh, goes to pooja kumari sharan pires and somya maheshwari a uh, congratulation to all the winners and the special mentions of essay writing uh, winners of poetry again we had hindi poetry and english poetry lot of poetry so again we have categorized two kind of sections hindi poetry first prize goes to chandrasen kori second prize goes to priyanka swain third prize goes to kalyani singh english poetry first prize goes to clarita mendes second prize goes to mahathi narayana swami third prize goes to ankita das a special mention in english poetry is aslam ali and somya maheshwari again congratulations to all the participants and uh, the poetry is amazing uh, but these are the prizes and the special mention winners for poster making uh, the first prize goes to anshika maheshwari second prize goes to ruchi agarwal third prize goes to madhu sharma there are six special mention here avni uh, avni khand pekar dhawal waghela khushi agarwal nishi zalzo shiva sirsagar tejas pagare amazing posters our judges are given quite a great review about it uh, there were a huge amount of uh, uh, you know inputs into it and amazing but there were few one who had very strong message and i think that's it congratulation to all of you i will move to winners of wildlife photography anand would you like to declare it in wildlife photography yeah. no you declare them i'll show the photos after okay, you're great. done great so winners of wildlife photography the first prize goes to swastik pritham uh, shall i mention the photograph uh, which was uh, yes stated? please okay yeah. so first prize goes to swastik pritham the photograph was of mating frogs the second prize goes to vivek kumar patel uh, Anand, shall I wait for your screen? Ah, huh, just one second, ah, huh? please. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah. Can you see it? No. Yeah. So yeah. the first prize goes to Swastik Pritham. That's the photograph mating frogs. Ah, uh, uh, we can't see the full screen. Uh, can you? Yeah, Anand, can you make a full screen? Sorry. Yeah. No, no, that won't work that way. So what you have to do is stop the sharing, uh, sharing, and go to uh -huh. select the Windows Photo Viewer or whatever viewer you use. Windows for? Windows Photo Viewer. Okay. Or whatever Photo Viewer you are using. Ah. Uh -huh. Do that instead of the Explorer. Okay, okay, okay. Fine, fine. Yeah, stop, got it. Stop the sharing and share that. Yeah. One second. Yeah, uh, because I think I'm here and it's. uh uh 
guys. Stop share. Stop, stop the share screen. Then do it. Uh, yeah. Done. Okay. Now, when I do a share screen, I'll have to first open that and keep, and then switch, Correct. right? Correct. So we had a large number of photographs and uh, some of these really stood out very strongly in terms of their composition and the you know quality. Uh, just one thing I'd like to mention uh, before yes. I switch to the result is that uh, globally uh, photographs of birds in nests, their eggs are completely banned. So uh, although uh, we had not specifically characterized mentioned to it, uh, we re request all participants to please not uh, ever try to take photographs of birds on their nest uh, or their eggs because it disturbs the birds and they can abandon uh, their nest. Aprajita also mentioned about how chicks, uh, uh, the hornbills are also very sensitive towards people movement over there. So you should be a little ca careful about that. I, I don't, I know, I hope now this works. Yeah. Can you see now? Hello? It's, it's a black screen yeah. for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just one yeah, second. I think it is loading. Uh, yeah. Can you see? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the so, first project. The first prize is Swastik Pritham, that's the photograph of mating frog. The second prize uh, goes to Vivek Kumar Pater. That's uh, the photograph of jungle cat in a field. The third prize is a tie year between two of them. So the third prize goes to Arun Kurke for light, little egret eye with fish eye. Now that's a beautiful view, I feel. Yeah. Sorry, the second picture. Okay, I, I could not download. The second picture is not getting downloaded. I tried it several times, but you can un announce it nevertheless. Yeah. The third the third prize tie up again is Daval Vagela, uh, which was for ground orchard. And there are several seven special mentions. Uh, do you want to show the special mention, Anand? Or just make, just go just with make, that? we will put them up on the page of uh, Correct. Youthful India. You can please visit Youthful India and see the results on that. The posters and the correct. photos, we put them up over there. Correct, correct. So seven, seven special mentions in wildlife photography. First is Akash Mudgat for Shikra. Second is Arun Kurke for black winged slil, stilt. Uh, stilt. Third, uh, Arun Kurke again, that large dyed egret with marsh harrier. Chirak Tang, peacock, fancy butterfly. Jahannavi Vayar for giant squirrel pair, Kushi Agarwal Babul tree in grassland, Prashant Kumbar Brahmin Kai kite and Raja Five. So congratulations to all of you for your uh, you know prizes and uh, the special mentions both. Anand, would you like to add something here? Yeah. Uh, even if when you're taking a picture uh, on your composition. Uh, please remember that you know uh, uh, you should either use it uh, if you have heard Sachin Rai's talk. Uh, he had clearly mentioned about using a horizontal or a vertical frame. Uh, a slant frame does not work because uh, neither is it printable nor is it viewable on your screens. So many people use the mobile or the camera in a slant manner. So it's avoidable to do that. Uh, second thing is that uh, please document things that are around you. Uh, it will really be helpful and we hope that these five days of the biodiversity talks and uh, competitions have really helped you focus and understand the importance of biodiversity in your life. Uh, please write, start writing stories in your local languages uh, and share them with us. Follow all the groups, all the organizations. Uh, if there's a local nature club, Fulwari is there in Chhattisgarh as well as Yuvak Sanstan is there. Please join them uh, even virtually at this point of time you know, till the time the lockdown is open, you can do a lot of reading and we can share a lot of information with you all if you all are really interested in, uh, you know, getting involved in, in biodiversity conservation. So back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Thank you very much. Uh, a lovely week, a lot of uh, sessions.
uh, no doubt, a lot of information, a lot of new insights, a lot of understanding, uh, amazing research work. Uh, I mean, so a lot to learn. I especially thank Anand Pindarkar. Uh, he's been a great support in this entire biodiversity festival. Uh, thank you, Anand, for doing everything around us, you know, being there all the time uh, and helping out with things, no doubt. I would like to thank the entire Sprout team. Uh, I know a couple of names. One is Rahul Palekar and another is Amrita Padgaukar, uh, who's been a support uh, all the time uh, into this program. Uh, Patel and Siddharth Varadkar also. Okay, great, great. Since I don't know every one of them. Yeah, sure. I would like to thank all the organizers, of course, Fulwari, Shikshan and Yuva Kalyan Samiti. I would like to especially thank Ritesh Sau from Fulwari uh, organization and Shivam Mishra, uh, who have been a great support into the entire uh, program. Uh, I mean, so there are a lot of people who are working behind. I would like to even thank another organization, Youth Sanskar Foundation, uh, in which Abey Dubey, uh, there's uh, Akan Shasau, and the entire team who's been working on the behind. I would like to thank, of course, Youthful India. Uh, and uh, of course, the entire team of Youthful India. There's Driti, who's been always on the technical side. There's uh, Urja Doshi, there's Shailesh uh, Patspur, there's Kunal Patil, uh, there's uh, Spiti uh, Pragyadas. I mean, so there are a lot of people who've been working on the back end for this entire series of lectures and this entire festival to be a successful, uh, you know, to be a proper success. And I will like to thank all the participants for being present for past six days you know coming on time you know sitting the entire session uh, listening to it uh, continuously and i mean so i i don't know i don't have words for it but it's amazing to be with you all for this past five days and i learned a lot of things uh, i mean so i i want to explore more now i feel thank you anand thank you very much uh, thank you to all of you again and then any safe last and, word you want to say? Yeah, have a good, safe and happy weekend. And uh, if you are eating mangoes, jackfruits, jamuns, whatever fruits you'll eat, please collect the seeds or take a shoebox or take a old bucket or something and please try to plant them in that. Germinate them. Once the rains are, uh, are settled or if the lockdown opens out, we can go to some nearby hills and uh, river areas and we can start doing our plantations. We have to work in ecological restoration very strongly. Okay? So thank you and uh, please stay safe. Please stay safe, stay home and yeah. <laughs> Take care. Diviti?